The Lord be with you. <clears throat> A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus spoke to the crowds, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? They answered, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. The Gospel of the Lord. I had an opportunity to spend a few days out at the lake this past week um, at the priest cottage, and uh, there's nothing quite like being out with nature at this time of year, and certainly we're in the heart of the summer, and uh, being able to be out there, you know, you know, our, our gospel speaks of the kingdom of heaven and certainly the peacefulness and the connection with nature kind of, uh, and the quiet is kind of re, uh, reminds me of, uh, you know, just that, that hint of that reality. And certainly I had a few little experiences with birds this week. I'd wake up early in the morning and I'd hear the birds. I wouldn't hear traffic, I would hear birds singing. And I thought, what a good place to wake up to. However, the very first morning I was there, about 7 o'clock in the morning, I heard a thud. And I thought, oh, somebody's trying to break in. What's going on? I get up, who's trying to break into the cottage? Uh, and I look out on the front deck on the, on the balcony just outside the patio, and there's a little bird laying on its back just outside the, the window. And his little claws are up like this, and its head's to the side. And I didn't know whether it was alive or dead. And I thought, oh, this bird ran into the window. So I, I went out and I checked the bird, and it was, uh, eyes were closed. And then I kind of got a little closer. His eyes opened, but they were swirling around in his head. So I knew he, oh, he's pretty, he's stunned. Well, well I'm going to go get my camera. I want to get a little picture because he's probably going to wake up and start to fly away. Well, I got my camera, and by the time I got my camera, he had already struggled to his feet and tried to get out, but smacked into the plexiglass railing of the balcony and fell into the flower pot. And I got my camera going, and then it just it fell out of the flower pot. And then it kind of flopped around, and then it got underneath the railing and flew into the trees, and it was okay. So that was my first of three episodes with little birds. The second one was... There's a little fire pit, a little, one of those little grills uh, with a lid on it, you know, that you can put little fires in. Well, I was walked by on the patio, and there was a bird stuck in there, swirling around like it was in a merry-go-round, you know, and it couldn't get out. I don't know how it got in there, but it was in there. I guess it got in, there's a little hole in the bottom, but it couldn't get out. So I just lifted the lid, it flew away, and I said, you're welcome. And that was that. Third bird encounter. It was early in the morning, one no, Tuesday morning, maybe Wednesday. I was up, sitting out on the deck in the quiet and praying. And I just looked around, and there was another little bird, a little yellow, I don't know, it was a budgie or a canary bird. I don't know my birds very well. It was yellow. And it was just sitting at the corner of the balcony on a little 
case uh, on a little box, that container for, for cushions for the patio chair. It was just sitting there facing the other way. And I thought, well, that's awful strange. So I figured as soon as I get up, it's going to go away. It didn't go away. I got up close to it. I looked at it. And it's just a teeny little thing. Eyes were closed. So I spoke to it. No reaction. But it was sitting upright. And I stroked it with my finger. And its eyes opened like that. But it wasn't even startled. It just kind of sat there. And then he started talking. He, okay, were you sleeping? And what were you know? And he, well, he didn't answer. Um, but a few minutes later, it popped up. It stood up, looked around, wasn't in any hurry to leave, and then just took off out into the trees again. So anyway, I just share those because there's kind of a fun way to, you know, to be able to interact with nature like that and to, uh, to, to be in a place like that, there, there's, there's a kind of a, a connection, there's a communion, there's a sharing with nature that St. Francis knew a lot about. And I think that, that those are the kinds of things that, that maybe give us little hints or, or remind us of, of, of the kingdom of God. So we can try to picture what the kingdom of God really means and what, it, what it's like. We've always tried, we try to, and it's not merely about living in the lap of luxury or having all our physical comforts met. It's, it's not like sleeping on clouds and waking up and playing your harp once in a while. We have all these images because we have imaginations. We can create images of what the kingdom of God is like. And we kind of project our human uh, uh, perspectives on it. But really what Jesus is getting at in the gospel is a little more about the disposition of heart that goes with the kingdom of God. It's not about the physicality of it so much as it is that sense of belonging. It's about discovery. It's about obtaining a hint of an answer to the deepest longings of our heart. A longing that we've never been quite able to put into words. A feeling of belonging, perhaps, of discovering who we truly are and how we're intimately connected with all creation. It's the addressing of a longing that goes far beyond the cheap facsimile that the world offers as a substitute for what God is offering. And when that longing is answered, we realize that everything else pales in comparison. Nothing else matters to the same degree. And if we find it in this life, we also realize that it doesn't eliminate all the pain and struggle and turmoil of this world like the person who finds the treasure and hides it in a field, sells everything he has to buy that field in anticipation of something great. And that's all that matters right now. Somehow we find that the challenging things of life in this world, when we're in that disposition of heart, don't threaten us so much anymore. Because there's nothing to be afraid of anymore. We can be broadsided by the worst catastrophes the world can offer and remain relatively unshaken because the kingdom of God reigns in our hearts. Many of you probably remember the famous speech by Martin Luther King shortly before his assassination. You know, he, can, he says, I have seen the promised land. I probably won't get there with you somehow. Intuitively, he said that. And he used the image of Moses leading his people out of slavery. And he says, I fear no man. He had gotten to that place where he wasn't afraid anymore. The kingdom of God is at hand. That's the place that we search for or open ourselves up to in this world. It's that part of us that needs to be discovered if it hasn't already been. That part of us that allows us to then not live in fear or that we have to be politically correct or, or that we have to be someone that we're not. It also means that we can forgive when we've been hurt or threatened. It also awakens that part of us that knows that Vengeance on our enemies isn't the answer we are looking for. 
that will satisfy. In our first reading, Solomon had his priorities straight when he ponders what God is offering him. The Lord in a stream, in a dream, asked Solomon, ask what I should give you. And Solomon's response after much pondering is a noble one. As heir to King David, was, he was aware of the daunting role that he was inheriting as the son of this great king. And he asked for help. Help from above. The help from God, as his father did. And the Lord's response, because you have not asked for long life or riches for yourself or vengeance on your enemies, I will give you what you ask for. We all know that too often in this world, history has shown that positions of power such as that was given to Solomon end up becoming venues for self-interest and abuse of power. Yet in our reading today, Solomon asked for the gift of an understanding mind and for the ability to discern between good and evil. And this was granted to him. St. Paul, in his letters to the Romans, reminds us that just as sure as the Father sent the Son into the world to lead humanity forward, the Son will be the first born among many brothers and sisters who have been called to follow in his footsteps and continue the mission of redemption and salvation that was inaugurated by Jesus. Yet to be adopted sons and daughters in Christ carries to carry on his work requires that we hand over ourselves, our very selves, to his purposes over and beyond ours. Because that's where our fulfillment truly lies. And St. Paul says more than once in his letters that as, as Christians, in our baptism, our lives are hidden in Christ. What motivates us from here forward is the kingdom of God and discovering that requires perseverance. And the image that Jesus uses in the gospel alludes to the notion that the kingdom of God to which Jesus speaks is upon us. And that reality of time and its unfolding and how that will happen, that's not of our choosing. But what we have now in this valley of tears is a promise. A promise of the grace of the spiritual gifts that God gives to persevere in a world that pulls things apart rather than brings them together. We live in a world that's a mixed batch. We can look at our daily lives, and as Father John said at the beginning of Mass, you know, the kingdom of God is all around us if we could per perceive it. And the sacraments hopefully help us awaken to that kingdom of God among us. However, when we look at the news and we see what's going on in the world, the violence, the, 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 the separations, the, uh, the conflict, we can be pretty sure we're not going to see that in the kingdom of heaven. We have to navigate around those things and realize that somehow God's work is being accomplished over and above those things and through those things. But we can look at our own lives and we can see the way the kingdom of God is at hand. The way a mother holds her child, the way couples embrace and show their love for each other, the way people lay down their lives for one another in so many ways, the way we connect with nature, the way we experience God in the quietness of our hearts during our prayer time in the community the various ways that God's manifestations are very much among us. And so, as we prepare to celebrate Eucharist together, we ask God to bless us with an ever greater awareness of his presence among us. That anticipation of a fullness that is already but not yet. We're kind of in, in that place of transition. We ask God to bless us with the perseverance and courage 
to open our hearts up, to separate what's helpful in our lives, pull out the bad, and embrace and nurture the good.